Making whiskey is an act of love. Making rye is masochism. I think that there's only a handful of distillers out there that love rye the way they do because it is a hard, it's a hard mistress to keep. Kind of like having a tiger by the tail, right? You have this beautiful animal and you've got him by the tail. Don't you dare let him go because he'll bite you on the ass. As much as Jim Beam would prefer a person buy a bottle of Jim Beam over a bottle of wild turkey, I'm gonna guess they'd rather somebody buy a bottle of wild turkey over a bottle of scotch, or certainly over a bottle of New York whiskey, you know? So there's a strength there because they have that collective ability to tell that story. And that's an incredibly rare commodity in an era when being able to create those kinds of collective stories is so hard. It's so hard to tell those stories and to, to, to build a product like that in a genuine and organic way, you know, because it's just, everything's too communicable now. It's every, there's, 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 there's no room for, for insularity. In fact, I feel like we're actually in an environment now where people look at insularity with suspicion when you're doing it. They like the product of that insularity, you know, they love Kentucky bourbon, but if a cabal of Kentucky bourbon people got together to try to do something outside of uh, the public eye, people are suspicious of that. So why did we keep it secret? So, Christopher Williams at, at Coppersea came to me and told me about this project that he and several other distillers from New York had, had started, started talking about, had, had moved forward with, and wanted to kind of give me the inside scoop on it. Who doesn't love whiskey? Empire Rye, it arose out of a community. I think more than anything, I've always been interested in the simplest version of something. Because once you got down to that simple thing in its most raw and elemental form, you can really only then, I think, be able to say you understand it. And you can add on to it from there. You can develop it and, and you know, until you understand that melody and the chord progression and the tempo and, and obviously your instrument, you, you can't ever really hope to solo. This is barley, and those are the rootlets. So we're basically trying to, we're, we're basically sprouting 
the, the mall. It's like making bean sprouts, um, except on a large scale. It was really interesting to talk to him about it at the time because it was plugging into a conversation that I knew was already going on among distillers in other parts of the country. And it was this question of terroir, which also intersects with another question, which is sort of similar, but not necessarily the same, which is just regionalization of whiskey styles in the United States. The United States is this huge country, but we're so used to a commoditized, very sort of generalized whiskey profile, a bourbon profile or rye profile. And so one of the contentions being made by these younger distilleries was, no, there are actually regional styles. Uh, and in fact, there are regional climates and regional grain varietals and all these sort of regional qualities that we can embrace uh, to set ourselves apart from what other people are doing and, and really to make kind of take the next step in what, what we're doing. Christopher Williams is, to me, the epitome of kind of the farmer distiller. Uh, he lives on his, his site. He grows a lot of his own grain by himself. He built a lot of his own equipment. Uh, he uses an old Portuguese still that is direct fire, which is, uh, no one does that anymore unless you're crazy. Uh, or you're someone like Christopher who really wants to make this back to basics 19th century style whiskey as was the tradition in New York. I mean, Hudson Valley was, uh, was a hotspot for rye whiskey in the 19th century, and so he's making whiskey very much like that. And, and while Copper Sea has grown as an operation, it's still very much personified in Christopher. We looked back and wanted to understand what whiskey was at its, at its core. And once we sort of really understood it, we realized that it was actually a lot more complex and nuanced than we'd ever been led to believe it was. And we realized it was actually by going backward to what it originally was, we were actually introducing something completely new because the current whiskey context is, is one in which the, the story makes it seem really simple, but it's actually become incredibly complicated through, through the process of the industrialization of, of the process. But once you actually start digging in, you realize that this is something that nobody could ever hope to make themselves the way that it's made in the broader industry. But then when you think about it more, you think, well, this is something that was developed by bearded, kilted men in the highlands of Scotland or, or, or Ireland in like the 15 and 1600s. And they didn't have giant, complexes of buildings with major industrial equipment in it. They just had copper pots and a fire. There's, there's a lot to be said for saying, okay, we don't just make whiskey, we don't just make rye whiskey, we make a New York style. And so that was sort of a, an interesting question. It was a conundrum. It was like, what does that look like? One of the things that makes Empire Rye so significant is that it is, it, it builds off of the farmer distiller license, you know, mandating that you have to use a certain amount or a large amount of New York grains or fruit to make, uh, to make your product. Every year, there was more and more interest from local farmers to understand uh, what the market for grain that they might grow would be. To remember that grain hadn't really been grown in any meaningful way in the, in the state for 100 years. My original plan at the time, I had been looking for a piece of property for a while to build a climber's ranch, a place where climbers, a quarter of a million climbers a year come to this. It's the biggest climbing destination on the East Coast. And uh, it, it has no investment in climbers at all. There's like, there's no school programs, there's no town uh, connection to it. Uh, so it amazed me and I thought, well, I'm gonna build a little camping ground and a uh, bunkhouse. So uh, I bought the property and uh, as soon as I did, the neighbors across the river uh, pounced and uh, just spent the next two and a half years uh, driving me almost into bankruptcy uh, by, by keep 
kept catching me up in process. You know, there, it was, uh, there were zoning questions that to me were very clear and to the zoning officer were very clear, but these people did not like them, so they came after me. And after two and a half years, I ran out of money, I had to sell half the property off. We started with 36 acres, I had to sell half of it off. And um, I called the local zoning officer and I asked him to come by and tell me what I could do with this property to make a living that I had a right to do. And he said, well, you're in agric an agricultural district and you have a right to farm. Didn't exactly thrill me, but he also said that a winery is a farm use. So I started looking into wineries. I discovered in the course of that research that the state had just passed a new distillery class license, the A1 license, which was a sort of junior distillery license. You could make up to 35,000 gallons a year of anything you wanted from anything you wanted, meaning you could import grains and fruits from elsewhere. The fee went from $65,000 down to $1,500 for three years. I spent that first winter uh, in my kitchen in the big White House that's over here behind the mill. And um, I, was, I built a little stove top still out of a whistling tea kettle and some copper wire and a plastic bucket. Um, I got the design off a website called dangerouslabs.com. I built it and it worked. And I started buying the cheapest wine I could and beer and just bringing it home and trying it out and reading about it to try to understand the process, what was going on. Ralph is this guy who absolutely changed the game and he is, to me, in a lot of ways, the father of the farm distilling license and the farm distilling craft uh, wave that, that hits the country. Uh, there was no such thing as a farm licensed uh, distillery when Ralph started. There were no small distilleries. By the springtime, I felt confident enough to say, I can do this, this is, this is not rocket science. We spent the next two and a half years building it. We found that if we used three gallon barrels, we could barrel a whole bunch of it and it would be ready relatively quickly. And uh, then after about maybe two months, I opened it up just out of curiosity, figuring it's not gonna be anywhere near ready. And I tasted it and I said, man, this tastes like whiskey to me. So we started filling three gallon and five gallon barrels. I was really uh, motivated to make the first rye whiskey and make rye whiskey here. And so I went around all around this area looking for people who were growing rye. I found about a dozen people that are growing rye. N none of them had a combine. And that's what you need because you gotta be able to take the seed off the stalk. I finally went to Tantillo's farm one day to buy a pie. And uh, I started talking to uh, Bev Tantillo, who's the co-operator of this great farm. And uh, I, I told her about my search. And she said, well, we grow rye. I said, really? Well, you have a combine? Yeah, we have a combine. I was like, it's, they're, they're four miles from here. Well, I always say when opportunity knocks, I want to open the door. <laughs> My name is Frank Tantillo. I'm a third generation farmer. I grew up right here on this farm. My grandfather started it and uh, he purchased a house just down the road that we grew up in. I started work when I was seven years old, started uh, running machinery and doing work at the farm. Of course, my mother didn't like it much. <laughs> Yeah, this is just a small little uh, parcel here that we have rye growing on this year. Uh, typically, winter rye will give you uh, about 2,000 pounds to the acre. So around, I would say, 2008, the local distillery uh, asked me if I could do some excavation work for them. So I got to meet the, uh, the owners and they liked what I did and they started to inquire about small grains and grain production. I said, well, we'll buy all the rye you can grow and uh, 
make ready. It's a pretty simple thing. Rye is a grain, it's a grass, but it has its own different uh, characteristics. It's a little bigger than a sunflower seed, um, smaller than, say, a pumpkin seed. It grows on the head, and we thrash it off, and it goes in the bin. <laughs> it has this uh, just tremendous ability to overcome um, all obstacles. If it's rocky, it's a great place to grow rye. If it's acidic, it's a great place to grow rye. If you're not going to get tremendous amounts of sun, it's a great place to grow rye. It is the ultimate and easiest of all the grasses to grow. Um, we have wet ground, we have dry ground, we have gravelly ground, we have stony ground, and I plant for that. My whole objective is to uh, plant things like this, watch them grow, and you know, harvest them later on and be happy. <laughs>if you look at World War II, a lot of the great admirals in the United States Army were all from the Midwest. And you think, what the hell were they doing in, in an ocean going thing? But when you see a field of rye, it's this wonderful blue green during most of its uh, growth period. And even the slightest breeze, and it starts to look like the ocean. It really does. It looks like a lake or the ocean. You see the wind rippling throughout. And it is one of the most gorgeous and peaceful things you will ever see in your life. Then when it becomes a whiskey, um, a fraud as that is, uh, it becomes something much, much greater. It's got this fantastic otherness that separates it from things like barley and corn. It's not as sweet and it has a much more uh, profound flavor and depending on the rye you're using it's almost like wine I mean different ryes will give you a completely different flavor I grew up in Baltimore Maryland and started drinking what I thought was Maryland rye whiskey the brand was Pikesville rye when I was 17 my grandmother and I would have Manhattans together and I always had a a very personal and special affinity because rye whiskey is in part from Maryland. And the truth is that from an American standpoint, rye whiskey plays a dominant role in the earliest days. It's certainly been subservient in the 20th and 21st century, but it was a point of rediscovery of one of America's original distilled spirits, its original whiskey, and when you bring all those parts together, not just of the production, but of the agricultural sensibility about rye, it was something that, that simply excited us. Now that we're starting to talk about rye as a, as a category and really start to explore it, then you start to see, well, there are certain varietals that work really well in New York, and there are certain varietals that have historical significance. When you talk about rye, you're talking about American history. I mean, there's just no question about it. American rye, and especially New York rye, is all about place. You have to start with the history of distilling in America, which people assume sprung from Kentucky and Tennessee, because that's, of course, where we associate distilling now. But really, until the Civil War, most distilling happened in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Distilling really took off in New York in the colonial era through the triangular trade of molasses, rum, and slaves was really one of the ways in which New York City developed into such a important you know, outpost in the early colonies. But then after the Revolutionary War, people really turned against rum because it reminded them of that era and really wanted to make something that could be grown by American farmers. And rye whiskey was the first whiskey to be popularized. And then, you know, fast forward a, a number of years when 
cocktails sort of were invented. It, it's the natural cocktail ingredient because it has a nice spicy character. It has a lot of structure. It holds up to cocktails in a way that other whiskeys don't as well. You know, it certainly was a dominant spirit in the first, if you will, golden age of American cocktail culture. Really, you know, the 1850s, 1860s, all the way until Prohibition. The part where rye dies, <laughs> that's Prohibition. Along comes Prohibition. I mean, what's ironic is that most people think it was about a religious experience and it was run by the women's Christian temperance movement, but it was really the middle class and rich dumping on poor people in this country. Twice in a few weeks, the government has struck. This time, a brewery on South State Street said to belong to Al Capone. It's a scene of joy or sorrow, depending on how you feel about it. So when people were voting in Prohibition, they thought they were just getting rid of hard liquor. And then when the Volstead Act came out and got rid of everything, everybody was really surprised. Beer and wine are products of fermentation alone. But whiskey, a third type of alcoholic beverage, requires distillation as well as fermentation. So many distilleries are completely wiped out. Especially in the Northeast, there was just not a lot of good luck. There was very little to no whiskey left in the United States by that point. It was American whiskey. There were just huge cargo ships off the coast waiting for prohibition to be repealed. Irish whiskey and scotch comes pouring in. Canadian whiskey comes pouring in. They didn't have the foothold in the United States that they had after prohibition. They didn't have that foothold before prohibition. Americans drank American whiskey. This one day it was prohibition and the next day America just they all just changed their minds. No, it passed by a narrow margin, and then it was repealed by a narrow margin. There it was, the document which reversed the ironclad restrictions of 13 years. The effect of prohibition was our taste buds were dumbed down for another decade post-prohibition in, into that World War II era that had sort of the monumental effect of putting a few nails in a proverbial coffin that was American rye whiskey. The leftover rye brands at that time, because now you've seen the uprise in, in bourbon, are bought up by bourbon manufacturers. So all these other great uh, rye whiskeys are then moved to Kentucky. Whiskey like steel and oil had robber barons. There were companies that were interested in owning the market. And so these big companies came into the Northeast in particular, where there was a lot of small mom and pop distilleries and used strong arm tactics to close them down. So the small distilleries that lost out were rye distilleries. And the big distilleries that were the robber barons were bourbon distilleries. It falls further out of favor, really in the pre and post World War II era. The marketing of spirits starts to really come into play in the 1940s. And the marketing of rye took a few elbows, you know, to the gut, to the kneecaps, if you will, uh, and certainly at the expense of the rise of bourbon from Kentucky. Bourbon now unencumbered by any meaningful competition categorically domestically, was able to push its story to the national audience. And rye, uh, I mean, this is maybe the most tragic part of it. It's, you know, the death of rye, sad. The debasement of the name of rye, tragic. And very honestly, they're wonderful ads that portray rye whiskey drinkers as the blue collar, regular guy, as opposed to, if you'd like to be the genteel cocktail drinker, choose bourbon. And it, it's quite humorous now, but it took effect. And it really changed, uh, in a cultural shift, people's interest in what they were drinking. Brown spirits suddenly become unpopular, and whiskey takes a huge beating. Several of Seagram's biggest plants are sold off, their stocks are sold off. And then by the time you've got the vodka craze of the 80s, rye has really cratered. You know, most of the brands have gone away. 
Most of the big distilleries are making rye one day a year, and even that is just way too much rye whiskey. It's just building up in their warehouses. So by the mid-90s, I mean, they're almost ready to give away rye whiskey. I talked to one of the preeminent brands that helped bring rye back, and he was telling me that in the late 90s, he could buy a barrel of rye from one of the major producers, six to eight years old, for $360. And to put that into perspective, the wooden barrel's about 250, and there's over 200 bottles of rye in a barrel. So here you've got high quality rye uh, being sold wholesale at less than 50 cents a bottle right around you know, the turn of this last century. We have all these wonderful stores of whiskey, but nobody's buying them because everybody's buying clear booze. So we're stuck with this stuff with some of the greatest whiskey ever made. It's a fire sale. In the 1990s, rye was down to 100,000 cases a year. Nothing compared to American whiskey, which is like 44 million cases a year. And it's not until the, the craft whiskey revolution that you start to see rye make a comeback. There was a little bit of a cultural shift towards older, old-fashioned drinks that were more potent and more considered. And rye whiskey was very much a part of early cocktail culture. And so by discovering those older cocktails, they need a rye whiskey. And you've got all these young bar people down in Manhattan in the uh, early 2000s, and you slowly start to see these people asking for rye, that, you know, that rye was the dusty bottle at the back of the bar that, like, you were waiting for some old dude with a pack of, like, you know, Paul Malls to come in and ask for a glass of rye. Who, who the hell else was uh, drinking rye? It's, it's literally a handful of people who were just like, we're believers. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, <laughs> it's like this is like Jesus and the disciples, like, oh my God, rye, yo, oh my God, rye, let's go talk about rye. But it was all the right people at all the right time, it just happened. The revolution for uh, the second golden age of cocktail culture in the United States was really there for the taking. And over that 10 year period, really the, the first 10 years of the 2000s, there was a tremendous movement of interest in rediscovering historic American cocktails. What were we drinking pre-prohibition? And that was the moment of, well, one of the major components was cocktails with American rye whiskey. For a long time, cocktail making, you know, was about the assemblage of ingredients and not necessarily about the ingredients themselves. But there was another movement that was happening in food culture, which was the farm to table movement, where people were really taking stock of what kind of ingredients were they using. And so it was kind of the intersection of the farm to table movement and the craft cocktail movement and the craft distiller legal changes that made it possible for distillers to get started, that all of a sudden there's a market for rye whiskey, there's an interest in it being authentic, and there's the ability to service that through new distillers that are rediscovering this kind of older tradition of rye manufacture that has all but, I mean, it's been preserved in, in name, but not in practice. So it was a really fortuitous time to have all of these different forces converging. Prohibition in some ways reset everything. And then, and then the 20th century didn't really allow for much differentiation. So in some ways, the last 15 years has really been picking up on where the industry was a hundred years ago. But I also feel like that's the natural trajectory for American whiskey. I went down in my basement and pulled out, this, this is a bottle of the first rye made in New York. And I had this in my basement. I thought I'd bring it along for you. That's amazing. And I this was when I was still working on the Hudson branding. This is, was an interim label, but I was the, I was making the statement that uh, that the labels on most of the new brands were so complex and just oh, too much visual on it. I was ma making the opposite statement by making it as minimal as possible. It's only the required information is on here. Nothing else. And um, and I blew up, if you look here, it's the government warning. I blew it up to like twice the size it's supposed to be and put it in there so it's the dominant thing on the label. And I used, when I was going around selling it, I was calling it government warning whiskey. When I was going to Albany pitching the new law to get changed, I rarely spoke about alcohol. What I spoke about was agriculture, tourism, job creation, and tax revenue. 
And that made all the difference in the world because it really, the second largest industry, second only to money, the second largest industry in New York is agriculture. And so it was an important thing to get that on our side when we were speaking to the legislators in Albany. So I went to the Farm Bureau, to the New York Farm Bureau, and I told them what I had in mind, and they lent me the use of uh, their legislative uh, lobbyist, uh, Julie Suarez. I work now for Cornell's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. At the time of the enactment of the farm distillery law, however, I led New York Farm Bureau, which is the state's largest grassroots uh, farmer member organization, and I led their public policy team. So two first cracks in, in kind of the distillery movement. One, allowing farm wineries to produce brandy because that opened the door just a tiny, tiny bit. And the second one was reducing the license fee from 65,000. And that created, instead of a class one distiller's license, kind of like a subcategory, the class A1 distillery license. The A1 license doesn't come with the ability to open up a tasting room. And I saw that as critical. I mean, you could only look around at bars and uh, breweries and wineries to, to know that, you know, tasting cells. When the 21st Amendment to our Constitution repealed prohibition, it delegated all power to alcohol beverage control to the individual states. And so in New York State, we had a very strong three-tier system, which means you could produce, um, you could be the wholesaler, or you could be the sales outlet, but you couldn't mix between all three of those categories until the Farm Winery Act. And because you were using those New York farm grown ingredients, that's the only reason they had the exception to what I'm gonna say is move between all three of those tiers. The two people you never wanna go up against are either the unions or the liquor lobby because they're just super strong. There's a liquor store in every single member's district and uniformly the liquor stores and the wholesalers have been ardent, vocal, vociferous proponents of keeping the three-tier system exactly as it is with no changes at all whatsoever. And so creating this next category of licensees for farm distillers was regarded as an anathema to the liquor lobby. And so it was, um, it was very difficult. The seasonality in the Finger Lakes is, you know, we're, we get really dead around here. It's pretty desolate. Um, you're kind of seeing the, the early part of that right now. Uh, but uh, it's it's a place that people want to come in the summertime. It's, it's just booming. These lakes form uh, kind of a microclimate for the vineyards. So, you know, it doesn't get as brutally cold here as it does in other parts of the state. Um, keeps it a little more temperate. <laughs> Doesn't feel it today. So I'm of Scottish ancestry. My grandfather moved here from Scotland when he was a, a, a pretty young kid. And uh, you can kind of get that sense of this area, you know, being similar to Scotland with the, the rolling hills and the deep lakes. and. Um, it just feels very much like a place that he came from. I left my job in the banking business in 2006 and uh, just took a month or two just to try to evaluate some business opportunities. And this one kept coming to the top of the list that, that was something I really felt strongly that would be a good fit, uh, both from a tourism standpoint on the wine trail, but also just uh, commercially, you know, selling. New York State whiskey. So, you know, I, I had kind of floated the idea to some friends and family, and, and uh, but wasn't really taking it seriously. And then, then I started looking for the land for the, the, the business. And, uh, we built from scratch here uh, up on the uh, Seneca Lake. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden my, my wife, you know, she was, I think, seven months pregnant at the time. And uh, she, she realized I wasn't messing around with this anymore. And uh, I think she freaked out. She, she called my parents and they, they had like a little intervention where they sat me down and said, you know, what are you doing with your life? And, you know, we all felt the, the, the difficulties uh, commercially from the pandemic, obviously, you know, a lot more to worry about than just your own business, but it was, it was scary. The hardest thing for us was the actual shutdown. We, you know, we were forced to close our tasting room for about two and a half months, I guess. The uh, the downstate, you know, on-premise trade was was just crushed. I mean, we, we 
had you know bars and restaurants that we've been do doing business with for years that you know just they turned that off completely and um, you know so I, a lot of good friends in the business that you know were hurting but you know the, the state was supportive in some ways by uh, kind of adding some new privileges into how we do business so we were able to ship our products to New York State residents and then uh, they just turned that off like very quickly which was pretty tough. Um, it's something we're working on as an industry and I think uh, the Empire Rise you know would certainly benefit um, with something like that too if, if uh, we could somehow try to crack that nut. You have to understand that the Liquor Authority does not like change, does not like change. And I'm not saying they're bad guys, but the Liquor Authority's job is to regulate all this stuff. You look at it as wanting to start a business, they look at it as, oh no, another pain in the ass to worry about. The opposition to the liquor lobby looks like a lot of guys in very powerful suits who do an awful lot of political fundraisers every year. And yet it also looks like small mom and pop entrepreneurs who own and operate family-run liquor stores that have been in, in their own businesses for a long time. So you have to kind of be respectful of, of that dynamic. But there's an awful lot of people making a lot of profits being that wholesaler, that link between the producer and the retailer. People were concerned that we were encouraging uh, driving while intoxicated, that somehow creating farm distillery licenses was going to put alcohol in the hands of kids. So instead of being able to produce, you know, similar to the equivalent of the farm winery license, we had a 35,000 proof gallon limitation on what you could produce under the farm distillery license. But at the time, the farm distillery license was far more restrictive than the farm winery license. So while you could sell from your own place of business, you couldn't say sell at a farmer's market. You couldn't sell at another neighbor's farm stand. You couldn't go to some of the local, you know, wine festivals and, and stuff like that because they wanted to restrict access for a while. And so we had all of our county farm bureaus knocking on the doors of their legislators talking about how we wanted to have the opportunity to create a farm distillery license like we had the farm winery license to open the doors for farmers to just produce a different type of crop. I was talking to somebody and they said, oh, Ralph was the most annoying guy. He would call like every day. Did this happen? Did this happen? Did you make it happen? And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, somebody joked, well, I think they better pass it just to get rid of Ralph. But that's, that's the beauty of it, though. I mean, that's what you need. You need a bulldog to go in there and say, these laws are ridiculous. You're preventing business from happening. I, I like to think of it as a terrier. <laughs> they're, they're much prettier and they're more friendly when they're nice. <laughs> we had one member who was adamantly opposed, and, and I'll leave his name out of it. But I remember saying many, many times, you know, Assemblyman, there are only at least maybe seven farms in the entire state of New York that I can think of less than the 10 fingers on my hand who will ever open a farm distillery. So this is going to be a very small niche impact and you're not going to see farm distilleries open in New York City. You're not going to see them all over. I promise you this is not going to destroy the three-tier system. You're not going to see a huge number of farm distilleries. Once we got that license through suddenly the line was like around the block. And I've never been happier to be wrong. <laughs> because when you think about it, I'm like, maybe seven, maybe 10. <laughs> and now we have, at last count, 186 farm distillers. And so I'm happy I was wrong. Although I admit for all posterity, I'm a little chagrined that <laughs> I told these legislators that, and I really was very wrong. And then we said, I'm getting tired of going to Albany and lobbying all by myself. And it's not as effective. I need a constituency. So we invited all the distillers to come here and sit on the porch at, at the uh, tasting room. And uh, I, I said, we've got to form a guild. You know, we have to form a guild so that we can go to uh, Albany and speak with some weight behind us. And uh, they all agreed and we started it. We started the uh, New York State Craft Distillers Guild right then and there. I've always been interested in community organizing you know, and in the idea of power and, and what it means and, and how you get it. And the idea that a group of people working together could achieve more than an individual. And I, I think it was just immediately obvious to me that we were gonna have to, you know, organize to be successful. At that point, the New York Guild realized, you know, we really have something here, we're organized now. And we had gotten a, a number of important changes to the law that would make it 
A, easier to get your license, but B, easier to market your goods. And he really led the way, not just with distilling, which is what he did, but uh, he also led the way with rye. And that was a huge, huge thing. And we were like, rye? New York rye? What the hell is he talking about? And of course, he was right all the way down the line. American Distilling Institute had its annual meeting in Denver, Colorado. At that time, you know, small independent distillers, we were really, really, really tiny relative to the size of, of most of the participants in the distilled spirits industry. So we're at the ADI in Denver. There's three or 400 folks from across the country. A bunch of the New York distillers were there, and a bunch of us won awards that year. Um, New York really cleaned up. We got a lot of awards, and it was, it was exciting. So naturally, the distillers from New York all end up at some point sitting at this table with gold and silver medals around their neck, holding onto bottles they've just won things for, and trying each other's products. A bunch of distillers together were always eager to show off our projects. We were, you know, high on winning, and just I think we were feeling really good. We just kind of got on the topic of, you know, how can we make New York well-known in the spirits industry? And I remember Chris from Copper Sea sort of throwing down the gauntlet that he wanted to create a mark that was solely about quality of production in New York State. And I said, we need to get this, we need to get this New York whiskey thing. We need to make a whiskey style for New York State. Christopher had such vision, right? I think he, his enthusiasm was really palpable and I think we were all, you know, ready and excited to support that. Six distilleries representing a broad swath of the state, you know? So we had two New York City distilleries, two Hudson Valley distilleries, Finger Lakes distillery, and a Buffalo Rochester area distillery involved in the discussion. The main thing that came out of that conversation that night was that it absolutely could not just be a whiskey that was made in New York. It couldn't even just be a rye that was made in New York that some meaningful and, to some extent, rigid set of rules need to be created and adopted and adhered to. One of the big reasons was this question of provenance, because we knew that for it to really be valuable, we wanted to finally be able to end the, the question about whether we had a right to make a claim of provenance. And we knew that the, the stone or the foundation upon which any style was gonna have to be based that was gonna be taken seriously was going to be based on where the grain was from. And once we kind of settled in on that, that was when things really started to move forward. The following week after that, that seminal Denver drunken meeting, I sent out the first email. The first I remember everyone discussing it was, was sort of, it was a glorified email chain, really. It was rye whiskey in particular that had a, a New York story to tell. We only make rye, so we thought that that was obviously the, the right answer. <laughs> that email outlined a rye whiskey made with 100% Hudson Valley grain and a host of other very unrealistic requirements. But there was method to my madness. And that was, I, I wanted to engender a little bit of outrage and debate, but I also wanted to start with as high a bar as I could because I knew that if we went into it too open-ended, that we would end up with weak sauce when it came to what the standard would eventually be. Then bedlam ensued. Uh, there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Nobody got too pissed at each other, but at the same time, there was some you know, back and forth, and you know, some people wanted it to be this very, very narrow focus, and then others are like, let's make it as inclusive as possible. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams had you know, Independence Hall, we had an email string, and that was where we, we came up with our, our declaration of Empire Rye. After a, a, an additional five drafts, we looked at it and we said, 
yeah, that's it. Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, New York, inside uh, the Paymaster Building in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We opened in 2010 and started making moonshine. I got a still off the internet um, in like 2007 and started distilling, really not with the intent of opening a craft distillery because there was no precedent for that, um, but just to, with the intent of you know making moonshine and sharing it with people, which is illegal. So a college friend of mine, David Haskell, um, and, and I looked into getting a license and found that it, New York State had just changed its laws to allow for what would be a farm distillery. And um, so we were in the lawyer's office kind of looking through the new paperwork and it seemed like it was $128 to apply for this farm distillery license. And I now know that if we had applied 10 years before, it would have been $13,000 and a three-year commitment. And so we applied for that and became the first of the New York City craft distilleries to start operating um, in 2010. For us, there was an opportunity not to try to replicate or outdo what Kentucky was doing, but let's adapt for a New York audience and in so doing, figure out what, what does distilling in New York City mean, which for me meant borrowing from Scotch whiskey for this piece of it, or from Appalachian Moonshine for this piece of it, or from mainstream bourbon for this, or let's do something they only do in Japan, or Irish style whiskey. So this melting pot of all different distilling traditions and then assembling it to make the, a kind of American whiskey that nobody is currently making or has made. Nicole Austin, when she joined the uh, the folks at Kings County, she didn't really have much of a whiskey-making background. She had a chemical engineering background and uh, really understood sort of the, the science and the engineering behind distilling. But she was a very apt pupil. Going to school for distilling is not really a thing in the U.S., um, but I did go to school for chemical engineering, which is the discipline that covers and focuses on distillation. Uh, but it wasn't specifically with the idea of applying that to whiskey. Um, you know, the context that we learned about it is more like oil and gas, pharmaceuticals. Um, it wasn't until much later that I realized I could use that idea to make whiskey. So she was one of those early additions to the team. And from there, built a career. She started working with uh, Dave Pickerel as a consultant and, and then went off to uh, Tullamore Dew, and now she works at, at George Dickel. And so, you know, when I think about Nicole and her career, I think of someone who is, uh, you know, very much a distiller and a very much a manager, uh, but someone who is sort of exploring and working with the uh, more the hardcore chemical engineering management side of things. You know, I kind of thought it was going to be like the next Aaron Brockovich. Um, turns out <laughs> that that is not what my job was. I was in a bar being served by a knowledgeable and enthusiastic bartender about whiskey, and uh, he changed my whole life when he poured me a glass of whiskey and mentioned how it was distilled. I just realized, you know, that's what I went to school to learn how to do. You know, it's the closest you can really come to making art if you have really no artistic talent of any kind and you're only good at math. <laughs> she was just volunteering at first at Kings County and had her day job. And she proved pretty quickly that she was uh, uh, kind of born for this. Really, craft distilling was barely a thing at this time. You know, the industry was heavily dominated by just a few players. Um, and it was really difficult to get in. You know, I think it was pretty obvious at that time that the only way to run a distillery in America was to have the right last name. And, you know, that just felt a little bit discouraging. And so when I read um, about a craft distillery being licensed in Brooklyn, which is where I was living at the time, um, I showed up actually the first day that they ever sold uh, their moonshine legally in a liquor store and basically introduced myself and was like, I, I want to work for you. We started to make rye whiskey, but struggled with it until Nicole, who was one of our, um, she was our head blender. She had gone to a conference in Denver with some of the other New York distillers. And so she came back and said, let's, we're all gonna make rye whiskey to the same recipe and, or the same general parameters, and we're gonna call it Empire Rye. 
We were trying to be really thoughtful about, you know, what was going to create something that was a genuinely distinct whiskey on the shelf, that it would also be genuinely representative of New York State. Also, you know, that the strictures weren't so tight that it would still leave room for individual producers to express a unique style. We wanted this to be from start to finish, one maker, one distillery, one artist showing you what New York grain grown here, distilled here, aged here tastes like. So Empire Rye basically takes the standards for New York State agricultural whiskey and the standards for bottle and bond and, and sort of combine them into a standard that is meant to be a mark of quality. Those standards are it has to be at least 75% New York State grown rye. It has to be distilled, aged and bottled in New York. Uh, it has to be barrel aged at 115 proof or less, which is lower than most whiskey's uh, standards. And then it has to be uh, aged for at least two years in a, in a new charred oak barrel. And then it just has to be bottled at uh, above 80 proof, which is the standard. We started laying down the whiskey in our respective distilleries, and we just didn't talk about it anymore. We definitely were keeping the secret for a while. Why did we keep it secret? We kept it secret so that it could actually become a thing. We were very protective of the IP and the logo and the words and what could we trademark and you know how could we make sure that this little chick was incubated, you know, safely. If we had opened it up to every distillery in the state or if we'd opened it up to some social media campaign asking people what they thought you know, New York's whiskey should be, we'd have gotten the phone book and we would have gotten nowhere. Almost all of our barrels that we've ever made have been in 53 gallon barrels. Uh, and these are some of our oldest. This is barrel 13 and barrel 14. So those were made, that was some of the, the very first weeks and months that we were making whiskey. Um, but our oldest barrel is barrel number one. It's actually one of the few 30 gallon barrels we have. And it's all the way up there. I don't even know how much is still left in there, probably not a whole lot, but uh, we're gonna empty it out at some point soon. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary. And that was sort of before the, just just before the big, the big wave was coming. And, and so to be in front of it like that, you know, that it was, it was, a, it was a great time to, to start up and to jump in and, it, and it still feels very exciting. The growth is still, you know, uh, bonkers. We decided early on, even before we officially opened, that we were only going to make rye. For us, it was because we were a New York distillery. The, the rye history of what, what we were doing here, growing rye, the agriculture behind it, that that, all, that was all pointing towards uh, a rye whiskey. And, and we wanted to really emphasize both the New York heritage of rye, and then also the cocktail history behind it and, and how important rye was to, to making cocktails. By keeping the group small, they were able to sort of, uh, sort of cut the arguments a little bit shorter so that they could figure out what worked for everybody or what, what made sense as a strong standard for New York. I've known the Empire Rye core group for uh, a long time, and, and I sort of heard that they were talking about making a New York whiskey a number of years ago, but I sort of thought, you know, let them do their thing, but it didn't really fit into my business model. My rye in those days was, was still developing. I hadn't really uh, ironed out exactly what it was yet. 
Then, then fast forward a number of years, uh, my rye had sort of come into its own. I was uh, really happy with the recipe I had and, and where I was going with it. And I got wind that these friends of mine were, were um, sort of further along in the development of Empire Rye. And uh, in, in asking some questions, I found that, that coincidentally my rye was, was already an Empire Rye. There was nothing, I, I didn't need to change anything really about the way I made my rye to become an Empire Rye. So I, um, I convinced them to let me sort of um, get in on the, on the action not necessarily from the from the ground floor, but as someone describes as the, you know the first adopter. And so for me, the, the one of the hard things was just sort of getting used to the rye flavors and and exploring what I wanted my rye to be. Purely from a physical point of view, rye is also super difficult because uh, everyone is aware of this protein called gluten because it's sort of an obsession in our society. Rye has a, a protein called gliden, which is similar but different, and it makes everything super gloppy and sticky. I was ready to abandon it. It was like it took it took twice as long to make any rye whiskey as it took to make anything else. But my wife and business partner was was insistent on like we have to make a rye whiskey. It's it's uh, it's just so quintessentially New York. Making whiskey is so uh, wildly complex. You know, there's 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 things that change the flavor at every step along the way. You know, the, the, the science-loving person in me wanted to, when we started to, to like, check every variable and, and, and try it three ways and make it the best way. But the fact of the matter is, is the variables are so overwhelmingly uh, numerous that, that it would, I could make that whiskey for 20 years and not even end up with a production uh, volume of it. So really my standard for, for making whiskey has always been to just do it the, the, the best way that I feel in the moment. So we started and made rye whiskey, started laying it down in barrel with everybody else and kind of forgot about it. Everybody hurries to make their first batch so that two years and like two months later we can do the first big release down in New York City. And at that point we unveiled it to the, the world and the rest of the distillers in the state. It wasn't necessarily appreciated right off the bat. There was a, a bit of pushback. There was a bit of controversy that who were we to have gone and made these decisions and were we trying to control other people? And was it, you know, some sort of taxation without representation? Who are we to decide the whiskey style of New York? And why are we not including all the other distilleries in New York State? Well, we're the whiskey distillers of New York State. So I don't know who else would make that decision. In the beginning, outsiders didn't get it. This is not an industry you end up in, like, by accident, right? You know, you pursue it because you have a passion. And passionate people can be challenging. Speaking, uh, you know, glass houses here, right? That <laughs> can be pretty tough. The demeanor of the reaction from other distillers was a little bit of outrage or hurt for not being included. But underneath that, the, the nature of those people's reaction was really, in a way, it was relief because they recognized very quickly that they'd been given a gift. We'd put something in front of them that gave them the opportunity to tell exactly the kind of story that Kentucky gets to tell. Everyone was really clear that the goal was to invite more people in. You know, that the goal was always to share this work and invite other producers in. We came up with these guidelines that we think are both historically accurate and relevant to quality whiskey made in New York. And if you're open to following those guidelines, you can join us and use the mark and help us tell the great story of rye whiskey. And, and after about a year, once people really understood what we were doing and really understood that the motivation was really not about restricting people, but rather about being able to set that quality control, uh, we had a lot more folks join on there's over 20 distilleries now making Empire Rye here in New York, and every year we add more. It's really just quite a wonderful thing to see it coming of age and coming 
alive. I think that Jim Beam is a fine whiskey. Uh, I think that uh, Jack Daniels is a fine whiskey. Uh, I don't necessarily want to drink them. I'm going to choose other things. But the thing that I think craft whiskey has brought to the table, and I think it's important to uh, recognize it, is, is just breadth and difference and change. And there are so many different ways to make really good whiskey that, that big producers just can't do. They're buying their grain by the rail car and they're, you know, the, the still looks like a fire hose. It's, it's, it's just, uh, they can't innovate. It's just like, it's physically impossible for a big distillery to innovate. And, uh, and what craft whiskey has brought to the table is innovation and, uh, and variety. I started 2011 in the industry and very few craft distilleries. They had the shelf and it was like the one trick pony for getting whiskey, getting bourbon. You know, I went to try to find rye whiskey and it's like, it wasn't a thing. Like I wanted to make, you know, my grandmother's Irish cream recipe and it called for rye whiskey and it's like, nobody had it. And it's like, okay, well, this is a bit bizarre. And then you started seeing these craft players come out and we started getting a little bit more shelf space and we started getting a little bit more attention and you start getting big players in the whiskey and spirits industry that are like taking notice. Like they're buying up portions of distilleries. They're bringing those into their portfolio because they know that there's legs there. And to me, what ended up happening is the shelf started getting a little crowded. You got a whole bunch of small craft players in there. But the whiskey itself wasn't the best. And it was like early days, craft distilleries, they're getting their feet under them. They're trying to figure out what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And then the craft whiskey started getting better. And it started getting better. And it started getting better. And we've got age statements on craft whiskey that's not, you know, one year old, 10 gallon barrels. And everybody trying to use the smallest barrel that they could to get product onto the shelf. We have craft distilleries that have 10, 11 years under their belt in operation and they're putting out the best juice that I've seen in the craft industry right now, like bar none. And I would put some of these craft distilleries up against the big guys in Kentucky, and they're gonna come out on top. So this is 2015 rye whiskey, straight from the cask, uh, proof. I think when they checked it uh, last time they opened it, it was sitting right around the 114 mark, which it's a bit surprising for us because usually we end up losing proof. We're sitting about 110 most of the time that we're pulling spirit out of casks. Uh, this was from February, so we're at the, the six-year mark, going towards the seven-year mark on this, this spirit. Uh, cheers, you guys. My biggest fear is that you know, craft distilling in the U.S. goes the way of craft beer in the 90s. It was like, giant explosion. And then the whole thing came crashing down because everybody was cutting corners. They weren't worried about putting out the best liquid that they could. They just started putting out beer in little pockets because they could. It worked for a period of time, and then you had great used equipment out on the market because the whole industry collapsed. And then it took decades for them to come back around to like being what they are now. And like you can't drive down the road without hitting a craft brewery. I don't want craft distilling to go into that category. And I don't see it going that route because everybody's trying to put out the best spirit that they can. I think it's gonna be a slow burn. I think it's gonna take multiple distilleries getting involved with this. I don't think that there's gonna be like a celebrity that's gonna be like Empire Rise, the new greatest thing, and it's gonna be uh, flying off the shelves. I think it's just gonna take that, that level of investment by multiple distilleries, getting the word out, getting, you know, beating the feet on it, so to speak, and getting numbers behind it. If you hold a uh, tasting glass at about a 45 degree angle, you get a very different smell sensation down here at the bottom than you do at the top. Um, because as more oxygen mixes with the alcohol molecules, um, it dramatically impacts you know, what your nose is smelling. So whereas at the ba base of it, it's like a pure, like aggressive alcohol 
you get much more of those lighter like toffee and grass notes at the top of the opening. I was a political science major in college and my thesis was actually on um, prohibition and the political tactics that were used by the women's Christian temperance movement to get prohibition enacted. Um, and that, oddly enough, led me to then running a distillery. Um, and being one of the more northern distilleries, you know, right up here near Niagara Falls, uh, we do, we see a lot more influence from the Canadian whiskey culture than probably most distilleries here in the United States. Uh, my family's actually been making soup buttons, men's soup buttons here in Rochester since 1922. I grew up sweeping floors and dusting shelves and counting buttons. And actually it was at work that we discovered I was colorblind because I was sorting buttons into blue and green and I had done it very poorly. And my grandfather was not very happy. And so he holds out three buttons and says, which one of them is different? And I said, it's a trick question. And he looks down and says, no, which one of these three is different? And I told him I didn't know. So the joke when I was a kid is if I took over the factory, we'd only be able to make black buttons. So now I do make black buttons, but of the liquid variety instead. In the early days of Black Button, we ran a distilling school here. In every class, there's one or two either groups or individual people where their, their interest is at another level. And, you know, so when I first met the, the folks from Better Man, it was at one of our group classes and it was clear that they were going to go the distance. My family is very large and all my cousins are all lawyers and I didn't want to be a lawyer. So I started thinking that if my family's gonna be okay with me not being a lawyer, I might as well do something that everyone's gonna be okay with. So I decided that making alcohol would make everyone happy. We did the learn how to distill or learn how to set up a distillery course with Jason. And he mentions and lets us taste this spirit that's called Empire Rye. And pretty much just said, oh yeah, we got this little sticker we're going to try to make our mark. I looked at Anthony after he left the room, I'm like, we're gonna make an Empire Ride. You can't help but fall into the romance of it all. And when they're making really good spirit, you gotta trust that they know something when they come up with this designation. You know, having a group come together in an industry is infamous for people being very withholding of techniques. It's pretty amazing that everyone put that aside because they were just geeking out about rye and they wanted to establish something. Having that as an option for us as far as something that we can carry, have something that sits on a shelf and immediately a person can be like, this is labeled differently that we can pull and taste. It's good for everyone involved. And I wanted to be part of the culture of like establishing what could be considered the next Bourbon County. It's really confusing for our consumers and it's really intimidating to walk into a store and you see a wall of brown spirits and being told, grab something. You're gambling $50 on a bottle of something that you hope that you can drink. And if you don't win, you feel like an idiot. That's why a lot of consumers love bourbon because bourbon standardized that. You know that if you're getting a bourbon, the quality is probably there. So on the same end, coming up with Empire Rye, now you're starting to say, all right, well, I had this really good Empire Rye from this producer. I'm gonna try it from this one. And having a portfolio on the shelf allows you to know, cool, I like all of these. And as a retailer, you can say, well, now I can make a designated New York spot full of whiskeys and allows us all to kind of win in the end because where once there was like one lone bottle that just kind of was buried in the shelf, now they're arranging a display of all the Empire Rise that a consumer can easily see. The same thing with the bartenders too, is when you talk to them about how it's aged longer, how you're gonna get more of those oak, earthier, richer notes from it, 
now they're going to play with a drink. They can make a drink potentially that maybe wouldn't work with regular rye as much. And they can promote it and say, this was a spirit grown in New York. So now I'm sitting behind the bar. Maybe I'm a tourist and I can drink something that is kind of embodying a New York image, which is spicy, get out of the way. If you don't like it, you know, go fuck yourself. That one's our Excelsior mash bill, so that's um, that's 80 unmalted rye, 20 malted barley. Okay. But the seven-year-old is 100% malted rye. Now, are, you, are you sticking pretty much now? You're going to stay with Whiskey is this beautiful thing where it uh, it's it's both completely unimportant because it's whiskey. It's just a glass of whiskey, but at the same time, it's whiskey. It's got all these things going on in it. It's got uh, story, it's got agriculture, it's got history, it's got provenance, it's got culture. Um, you know, so it's, 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 uh, it's this mercurial thing. Oh, so we're at Glenwood, which is uh, in Cold Spring, New York, and we're, in a way, at the first convening of producers of Empire Rye. So, in a way, this is my first opportunity to be a representative of the core group and also to begin to think about how to bring uh, 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 sort of other people into the Empire Rag concept, how to create something that will last for a long time, how to, um, uh, yeah, make, I think everybody's goal is to make something that um, is meaningful, is easy to accomplish for a, from a distilling point of view, and then has traction with the consumer and will last, you know, as long as we hope to last as distillers, which is forever. <laughs> so that's, that's just a, you know, a little high stakes, but um, so being in this sort of uh, colonial sort of constitutional convention kind of surrounds, I think gives uh, a nice gravity to the whole proceedings. Rye whiskey was what New York made, you know, back uh, 150 years ago. It is our history. So the idea of a state designation around rye whiskey was uh, really a, a cool idea and right up our alley. And a lot of talking back and forth, and then we kind of codified the rules. You know, the greatest moments in American whiskey and really the true origination of American whiskey was not in fact dominated by one state or one small number of producers or one style, but that there was a time when there were many distinct regional styles and that that time was really the greatest time in American whiskey. And it just gives you a little bit of belief, you know, and hope that there's gonna be room for you because if there once was, there could be again, right? I will admit that it was not necessarily something I understood or believed in. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just like, we're all making rye whiskey and we're calling it Empire Rye. Like, what's the, that's, there's nothing there. But what I didn't realize, foolishly, is that people invest so much in geography around food production. And it was a great opportunity to, to connect with the other New York distillers who I had sort of perceived as my, you know, competitors. But all of a sudden, were not my competitors. They were my advocates. 
Hi, I'm George Catalo. I am the floor and social media manager of Parkway Wine and Liquor in Rochester, New York. Got our great wall of whiskey here, whiskey from all over the world, uh, near and far. But we stopped here at the Empire Rye and Rye Overall section. Everybody, you know, everybody loves a good story. It doesn't matter if it's about, you know, something fictitious or something real. A good story sells the bottle as much as what's inside of it. Building a whole new category that can actually put New York on a map in a different way, instead of just being a good generic rye whiskey, having that sense of place and sense of different standards and standing out and having a seal of approval, so to speak, I think that shows incredible foresight. Carving out a whole new piece of the market, instead of being the little fish in the ocean, you're a normal sized fish in a pond. I definitely don't like drinking them on the rocks, and some people will argue with me. I don't really drink whiskey or my Empire Rye on the rocks either. Uh, my mom always said, uh, you know, why start a fire if you're just going to put it out? <laughs> so, uh, I think it's our jobs, again, as bartenders, to kind of perpetuate uh, the message and to further the cause of Empire Rye. And I think that we're kind of foot soldiers in that way. You can almost unwittingly know if you see that label on there that it's going to be quality. There's not many things like that anymore. You know, even if it says FDA approved anymore, <laughs> like it doesn't mean it much, you know? Uh, but I think the Empire Rise seal almost has more integrity at this point. Uh, again, maybe don't quote me on that, but I think that that's something that there's a lot of, you know, greenwashing with organic and this and that and the other. This is another way of saying it, and it's not just to sell product, it's, it's to let people know who worked so hard on it, um, where it came from and why. I, that's what the label says to me. American rye could go one way, where after a certain point, it, you know, it reaches a certain amount of differentiation, but then there's concentration and you know, maybe there's a, uh, combined with a, a, a bust, where a bunch of distilleries close down, some are left, they get bought up by big distilleries, and the differences among them are sort of sort of frozen in place. Uh, or you could have uh, a, a world where America is a big place, there are lots of different submarkets, there are lots of different possibilities for regionalization and terroir differentiation, and, and always the opportunity to start up new distilleries. And so you don't have that concentration, instead you have uh, a continued uh, differentiation. And so we end up with a place that's, that's a little bit more like France. And, and, and I would love that to happen. It's funny how nature will take a tree or a plant that's injured and make it form a lot of seeds so it's, you know, it re regenerates itself, even though this is well populated here. <laughs> but it's, uh, that one's not as well as this one, say. See how the difference is in these two? This is a nice, healthy beard, and this one has an issue. Just my opinion again, it's corporate and local. Let's keep the local guys going. The corporate is going to do their own thing and they're basically trying to take over everything. I think if the person producing it is the person selling it, it just has a, a better feel to everybody around. This is rye seed, gonna be turned into whiskey. 
Right now we're having um, a little bit of a problem uh, getting some rye from last year to keep the uh, distilleries stocked with rye to uh, make whiskey. Um, but, you know, it just makes a few other phone calls we have to take and uh, we find it. We have a little bit left in our grain bin. Um, hopefully we get another four loads and we'll be good for this year. I am particularly trying to talk other farmers into growing rye so we don't have to go too far to get it, uh, especially this year because the trucking cost is so high. Uh, but a lot of people are really reluctant to put in rye because of the, uh, the yield isn't as good as corn. Uh, it takes longer uh, to do. You gotta plant it in the fall and you harvest it in July. So that's a long time for one crop. Um, farmers like to get two crops per year on their ground. Um, so I'm still trying. The last two decades, 15, 20 years, we've seen not just the emergence of the craft industry, but really the maturing of the craft sector of the whiskey industry. Whiskey is very hard to make. And there was a certain time when, when I know a lot of critics and fans we're looking at craft whiskey and saying, I just don't know if this is ever gonna be where we want it to be, or where they want it to be. And look, I mean, there's some pretty terrible craft whiskey, but there are some really fantastic, and a lot of really fantastic craft distilleries. And in fact, if you we were to go back 10 years ago and say, well, which ones are going to make it? You could tell the people who are really serious about it, and you could see where they were going and the people who had a good business sense, who had really good distil distilling skills, uh, those were the ones that, that have made it. I think hopefully Empire Rye is telling you a story about regions, right? And, you know, what is unique about New York? We think that, you know, 50, 75, 100 years from now, that, you know, it's a thing that people, you know, they know uh, internationally about that, you know, it's it's like the equivalent of Kentucky bourbon or, or Speyside Scotch. So you'll start to see a future where there are different regions of American whiskey, and there's maybe a moonshine region in the Appalachian Mountains, there's a bluegrass, Kentucky, Tennessee bourbon, Tennessee whiskey, there's grain-focused Midwestern whiskeys, there's Northeastern rye whiskeys. I have high hopes, you know, I believe that Empire Rye will be recognized as one of the great American whiskey styles. And I'm really proud of that. So really, it's kind of a David and Goliath uh, story about entrepreneurship and farmers succeeding and producing a product that consumers want to consume that's based in New York State's wonderful farm and food system. So I love this story because it does show when you mobilize the farm community, the food community, consumers, and have a good legislative environment, you can see wonderful products hit uh, people's store shelves and tables. The biggest success that Empire Rye could have is that it is so well known and so ubiquitous that nobody really gives a shit who made it. It's just that thing that's always been there. A hundred years from now, people will say, that's the Empire Rye Shelf over there. You know, that's the rye area. Those are the Empire Rye's. And people say, well, clearly I'm going to get an Empire Rye. They're not going to quiz the person about who invented it. Now, is there going to be some nerd like me who's going to go on the deep dive and learn all that stuff? Yeah, of course, hopefully. Um, and when he comes across my name, if he says, oh, that sounds like an interesting character, sure, that'd be awesome. You know, what's worth more than a pitcher as far as words? <laughs> a sip of this. Uh, for me, I just let them try it on its own. And I think immediately, you know how good it is just by trying it. 
and you know immediately why we're doing it. And it's not just because we're local. Because that's the other thing, too. I think there's a lot of times people say, hey, what's local? I want to try what's around here and what people are doing in the area. Um, but sometimes people just do it as a favor to your home. You know, We have this internal bias. We're rooting for the home team. But when it's really good, it makes it so much better. <laughs> it makes it so it wins the argument every time. You know, you're like, I'm just doing it because it's local. No, you're doing it because it's the best possible option. <laughs> I really wanted it and it made me want it. <laughs> just talking about drinking it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a hard sell once you have a sip of it.